welcome to our Sunday night service. Let's start by seeing number 26. Number 26, we started this morning because I picked it because it was my wife's first Sunday back in church for a while. It's her first, her favorite song. But she was with Rosie somewhere else in the auditorium when we sang it. So she's like, I didn't even get to say, come thou found. So not embarrassing her and saying, let's start with it tonight. So number 26, and let's stand together and sing, come thou fount of every blessing.
1946.
176, Christ arose, verses 1 and 3.
coming again, 206. <laughs> Father, thank you that we get to be gathered together this evening. Thank you for the songs we got to sing. I pray that you'll help us with our memory verse now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's have some announcements. So, uh, oh, yes, thank you. Just let me uh, get the last drop so it's not wasted, you know. <laughs> um, for your announcements, remember that Wednesday night is our business meeting this week. So, Wednesday night we'll have a, a few songs, then a devotional, and then the business meeting. So um, just remember that. Everyone, of course, is invited to come and to take uh, action in the business meeting. Of course, you need to be a member for that. Um, then remember next, or first of all, Saturday, uh, Lord willing, we'll have more flower distribution. Lord willing, as in if it's good weather, and then Lord willing in that I'm hoping to pass them out throughout the week, and it might be that we run out before Saturday. So uh, if you'd like to pass them out throughout the week as well, I'd love it. <laughs> love all the help we can get here. But there's some in the coat room right there on the back table. And uh, if you'd like to pass them out, please feel free to take some and pass them out. If you're going to pass around in the peninsula area, just let me know where you're wanting to go or where you're going to go, just because we don't want to get the same people twice. But if you go in your neighborhood... Well, I'm not going there, and I don't think anyone else is going to randomly go there, so 
you'd be free, of course, just to take them and go over there. Um, and then remember, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, in the evening, we'll have that baptism service. And uh, no, we, I haven't talked to the board about it yet as well, but we won't have the Lord's table. And uh, I'll have to confirm, but we'll more than likely have the Lord's table the next Sunday night. So um, just remember that next week is the baptism service. So we're excited about that. Um, let's take our Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 43. Genesis chapter 43. Genesis 43, and when you find your spot, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Let's actually start by reading the last verse of chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42, verse 38, we'll read first. And he said, Jacob, he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then, you sh- then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. That's Jacob's, um, that's his plan. That's what he's going to do. But God has a way of changing our plans, doesn't he? It says in verse 1, And the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass, when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me, as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother? And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye yet another brother? And we told them according to the tenor of these words, Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so, now do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels, and carry down the man a present, and a little balm, and a little honey, spices, and myrrh, nuts, and almonds. And take double money in your hand, and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. Peradventure it was an oversight. Take also your brother, and arise, go again unto the man." And God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And the men took that present, and they took double money in their hand and Benjamin, and rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, Bring these men home and slay and make ready, For these men shall dine with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, Because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time are we brought in, that we may seek occasion that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for bondmen and our asses. And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house. 
and said, Oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass when we came to the inn that we opened our sacks, and behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, and we have brought it again in our hand. And other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. And he said, Peace be to you. Fear not, your God and the God of your father have given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simeon out unto them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their asses provender, and they made ready the present against Joseph came at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present, which was in their hand, into the house, and bowed themselves to him to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom ye spake? Is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant our father is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God, be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on bread. And they set on for him by himself and for them by themselves and for the Egyptians which did eat with them with him by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, and the men marveled one at another. And he took and sent messes unto them before him. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that's before us this evening that shows us what happens when we come to the end of ourselves. Lord, I pray, Lord, that everyone here this evening will not go it in their own strength, not go it with their own resources, but each one of us, Lord, will go in the strength of the Lord, come to the end of ourselves, and put our trust in you. I pray, Lord, that you help us this evening as we look at this scripture to see what a wonderful Savior we have. And I pray, Lord, that you'll fill me with your spirit to preach your word tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus told the story of a young man who wanted one thing, to get away from his father. When he got old enough, he asked his father for his inheritance, and when his father was still living, he asked for it. And the father gave him the money, and he took it, and he went away into a faraway country. And he spent all his money, the Bible says, in riotous living. And then the money ran out. And when the money ran out, the friends ran out. The good times ran out. And there came a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And there was a certain citizen in that country that the Bible says he, he joined himself to. It doesn't sound like the citizen had much of a choice in the matter. The young man joined himself to that citizen. And the citizen, he sent him into his fields to feed his pigs. And he fed those pigs, and the Bible says he fain would fill his belly with the husks that the pigs were eating. And there he was, in that poor, miserable condition. No man gave unto him. But the Bible says when he came to himself. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare? But I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And I always picture that prodigal son going home, not knowing what kind of welcome he was going to get, you know? How was the father going to react to seeing him after he had spent so many years away, so many years in sin, wasted all the living that his father had provided for him? But he didn't need to worry. When he was yet a great way off, the father saw him. He ran to him. He, he kissed him, the Bible says. And his son said, Dad, I've sinned. 
I have sinned against heaven in thy sight. I am not worthy to be called your son. But the dad said, bring the best robe and put it on him. Get shoes on those feet. Put a ring on his hand. Bring here the fatted calf. And that's, that's kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. He didn't need to worry about going home. His father was merciful. His father was gracious. His father was faithful. You know, there's one place that none of us want to go. We fight it. We, we, we don't go to this place at any cost. It, it has, to, has to be really bad for us to get there. It's the place that's the end of ourselves. When we come to the end of ourselves, we, we don't want to come to that place where we admit that we're out of options, where we admit that there's nothing left that we can do to help ourselves. There's nothing we can do to get ourselves out of the mess, but we must be reliant on the mercy and grace of somebody else. Nobody wants to go to that place, but can I tell you that that's that's the best place you can go when it comes to you and the Lord. That place where you stop doing it in your own strength and you say, Lord, I need you. I need you. I, I can't do it, but I need the Lord's help. You find in our text this evening that Jacob has finally come to that place. He's finally come to that place where he's got no other options. His plan is not working. His idea of not sending the boys and Benjamin, that plan just, that's not going to work. He has got no other choice but to throw himself to the mercies of God. God Almighty, be merciful to us. We saw last week that Joseph, or J Jacob, if he had any other option but to send his boys back into Egypt, he was going to take it. He, that was the one thing he wasn't going to do. He wasn't going to send his boys down into Egypt because what would happen to Benjamin if they went down? There was no har harvest. There was no crops. There was nothing. The famine was devouring those plenteous years. But Jacob wasn't willing to let them go. The last thing he'd do is let them go. He waited and waited and waited. But verse 1 says, the famine was sore. The famine was so sore. I can picture the conversations. Leah talking to Jacob. Honey, can you send the boys down to Egypt? We're hungry, Jacob. We need food, Jacob. Can, can you send them down? I said they're not going back there. But honey, we're, we're dying. What about Simeon? What about these other children? You're afraid of losing Benjamin. But what about the rest of us? I said my son is not going down into Egypt. I will not let my son go down there. And all the while, he's still holding on, still holding out, still refusing to give in. But man proposes, but God disposes. God got him back into Egypt. The famine was so sore. No rain, no water, no food. The corn ran out. Everything was so bad that finally Jacob says, go again, buy us a little food. And Jacob says, we can't, or Judah says, we can't go, Dad. I mean, the man told us, we, we can't go down without, Jake, without Benjamin. We can't go down without Benjamin going down with us. And Jacob said, had said before, no. Reuben had tried to intervene, but to no avail. And the fact that Simeon was left behind, bound in chains, that wasn't changing his mind. But now he's at that point where he's got no other options. He's got to send them back into Egypt. He's got to send them back. He's come to the end of himself. And the question for each of us tonight is, what happens when we come to the end of ourselves? Jacob in the text and his sons in the text, what you see are people who are terrified of this. 
They're thinking if we give in, if we go back to Egypt, give in to that Joseph and go back there, it's going to be the worst. <laughs> Simeon's already gone. We can write him off. What will happen to Benjamin? Why, does he, why is he so interested in Benjamin? I tell you, this man, he doesn't have our best interests at heart. He doesn't care about us. He's not going to help us. If we give in to him and we go back to Egypt, what's going to happen to us? And they were so terrified of it. But they didn't have to be. He had their best interest at heart. He wanted to take care of them all the time. And in our lives, God will often send famine, send storms, send trials to bring us to the end of ourselves. And yet we get scared. We don't want to go there. We don't want to go to that place where we lose control and we have to give it over to God. Where we have to say, Lord, I need your help. We don't want to get to that point. But if we do, if we just give it to God, we're going to find that God is more than enough to take care of us. He's merciful, He's gracious, He's faithful. And we can trust Him all the way. I wonder this evening, what happens when we come to the end of ourselves? And number one, what happens is we find a God who is merciful. We find a God who is merciful. In this text, these men, they're, they're terrified of going down there. Terrified of Joseph. Their, their money that they had found in their sacks the first time, that's weighing on their consciences. Even though they, they hadn't stolen it, they, they felt guilty because they had somehow had gotten back in their sack and it was constantly bugging them as they made their way back. But more than that, these men were feeling guilty of the sins of their past. These men were the men that, well, we know what they did at Shechem. We know what, they, what were the different sins they committed in the family. We know how Joseph would bring their evil report to their father. And we know what they did to Joseph. That is the greatest sin they had committed. And there they are, 20 years later, and they still have the guilt from it. You remember the last time they were down in Egypt and they saw Joseph, how the guilt was weighing on them and they said that now his blood is required on us. The blood of Joseph, that, that's why these things are happening to us because of what we did to him. And they're terrified of condemnation. They're terrified of judgment. They're terrified of what God is doing to them. But what they find when they come to the end of themselves is that God is merciful. God, they go back into Egypt and Simeon is restored to them. The money is forgiven. It's in their sacks again when they go again. And there was nothing to fear. God spared them from harm. He is merciful. Do you know that God is merciful? The devil will have us believe that, that, that we, we can, if we come to God, that then God will be so quick to, to judge us and condemn us. And the fact is, man is under condemnation for their sin. But the place to go is to God himself. Because he that goes to God will find his mercy. He that comes to the end of himself and trusts in the Lord will be forgiven. When we come to the end of ourselves, we find a God who delights in mercy. That's what he says in Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. He delights in mercy. These men, they didn't know Joseph. They were picturing him as someone who was out to hurt them, someone who was only interested in their harm. They thought that God knows about us and he's after us to hurt us and that's what's going to happen. But the fact is, God doesn't delight in wrath. He doesn't delight in judgment. That's his strange work. God delights in mercy. And he's waiting for men to come to the end of themselves so that he can show them his mercy. You know, notice how the second time they came to Egypt, how different it is from the first. Yeah, Joseph's still going to put them through another test. 
and we're going to look at that next time. Joseph's still got a test for them. But the first time he talked to them so roughly, the first time he, he accused them of being liars, and the first time they were standing there not at the end of themselves. They were standing there confident of who they were, confident of, their, of themselves in their own strength, in their own, in their own person. But now that they've come to the end of themselves, they're finding that he is kind and he is merciful. And the one they feared, you see in the text, they, they're sitting in his presence, being merry with him as he has been merciful to them. And that's what we find out about God. So many people assume that God is, God is out to judge when really judgment is reality. But God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's a story of a young man who left his good home in order that he might go out and escape the restraints and the restrictions and the admonitions of his parents. And so he went out and he left home and he kind of lived a wayward life. And one day he got the news that his dad had died. And so he made his way back to his home. And he got there as quick as he could and got there just as his father's will was being read. And in the father's will, he heard an account of the father's disappointments of his son and how the son had disregarded the father and how he had chosen to leave home. And in that moment, the son became so angry that the father would actually put that in his will, the way he had lived, that he got so upset that he left during the reading of the will. And he stayed away from his father's house for most of his life. But later on, when his health was broken, he returned home. And he began to read the rest of his father's will. And he read how his father had forgiven him. And how his father had set aside a great portion of his estate for his own personal inheritance. And how sorry the son was that he had not stuck around long enough to hear the rest of the story. You know, so many people stay away from God, not liking the part of judgment that they don't get to hear about the God of mercy. How God wants to forgive. How God delights in mercy. And what we need to do is come to the end of ourselves and cast ourselves to the mercies of God. That's what Jacob says there as they're leaving. He's got no other options. He says in verse number, verse number, uh, verse number 11, if it must be so, now do this. And then in verse 14, he says, and God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your bro other brother and Benjamin if I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. He threw himself to the mercies of God, and he found a God who is merciful. Number two, when we come to the end of ourself, we find not only a God who is merciful, but number two, we find a God who is gracious. A God who is gracious. We know Joseph's about to put them through another test, but you can't help but see how gracious he is to them as he treats his brothers, the ones that had sold him as a, as a slave 20 years earlier. Consider how Joseph is so gracious to them and points us to the grace of God. They say mercy is God, defined as God not giving us what we do deserve. And you think of Joseph, how he withheld his wrath and spared Simeon and the brothers. But now he's showing them grace. Grace is God giving us those good things that we do not deserve, those blessings that we haven't earned. It's God's unmerited favor. And you see in the text that not only does Joseph receive them the second time, but he invites them to his home. He sits them at his table. He gives them all food. The other thing he does, it's in the beginning of, verse, of chapter 44, and it's when he also puts the cup in their sack. But he puts all their money back again. They brought their money down the first time. Joseph gave it back to them. They bring their money down the second time, and Joseph puts the money back again. It's a theme with Joseph and his brothers. Their money didn't do them any good there. One thing about Joseph's dealing with his brothers is that their money never did them any good. 
Yes, Joseph had the Egyptians buy the food and the nations that came had to buy the food. But every time his brothers came, he put the money back in their sack. Their money did no good with him. And that's the same with God and his blessings. When it comes to the blessings of God and the riches in heaven, our money doesn't do us any good. (laughs) We're not going to buy God's favor. We're not going to ever be able to earn the wonderful treasures that God wants to freely give us. Our money does no good in securing the treasures of heaven. Our works do no good in securing the grace of God. And what we need to do is come to the end of ourselves. We stop trusting our hoarded resources and have our empty hands and just lift them up to God and say, Lord, fill them however you please. He supplies our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know who the giver is? God is the giver. You can't out-give God. I love the story of that farmer who just kept giving above his means and Everyone was wondering, how does he give so much? And he said, well, it's like this. I keep shoveling it out, and God keeps shoveling it in. And he's got the bigger shovel. <laughs> God's got the bigger shovel. We can't outgive God. Give, and it shall be given unto you. And God gives to us freely, gives us by his grace, gives us all that's needed, and then some. Like the brothers, we come to him empty, and he fills us. We go to him naked, and he clothes us. We go to him poor, and he pours on, onto us the riches of his grace. We come to him sinners, and he makes us saints. We come to him at the end of ourselves, and he supplies us with all of himself. And his grace, he is sufficient for us. The songwriter wrote it this way. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His grace has no love has no limit, his grace has no power has no measure, his power has no boundary known unto men, for out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. They came to the end of themselves wondering what was going to happen, and they found that he is gracious. All their needs were supplied, and they had everything they needed because they went, came to the end of themselves. Number three, what happens when we come to the end of ourselves? Number one, we find a God who is merciful. Number two, a God who is gracious. And number three, we find a God who is faithful. A God who is faithful. Think of how Joseph reminds us of the faithfulness of God in his relationship with his brothers. I think how he, he shows us in these verses that he's loved them the whole time. He's loved them the whole time. In the text, he invites them to his home, prepares a meal for them. Watch as he goes into that room all by himself and weeps over having seen Benjamin again. How he loves his brother and how he demonstrates his love to all his brothers through provisions, through hospitality, through asking them about their state. He loves them and wants to provide for them. After all, they were his brothers, and one of these weeks they're going to find it out. He was strange to them, but he wasn't a stranger. He was their brother, and he loved them and wanted what's best for them. You know what we find with God? We find a God who's never stopped loving us. We've sinned against him. We've wronged him. But he's never stopped loving his children. I think of how that prodigal son going home, not knowing how he would be received. But what was the father doing? Every day he was out at the end of that driveway looking down the road to see that boy return home. Every day he was wanting, he he was looking. Every day he was faithful to show his love for his son. And he saw him a great way off. And God shows us his love as he has sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. He is faithful. He he loves the whole world. He gave his only begotten son. And then I think of how Joseph showed his love by his care for them. There they are. They're concerned about that money in their sacks. 
are concerned about. How did that money get there? What's he going to say to us? What will his reaction be? But instead they find out that he's already supplied the money. The steward says, I had your money. And the only explanation could be that either they just let him not pay for it or that someone else paid for the food. I believe someone else paid for the food. Personally, I believe Joseph paid for that food that their brothers received. He was the one caring for them all the time. We thought we had paid for our blessings. We thought it was our resources that had accumulated to meet our needs. But we find our money is still in the sack, and God is the one supplying. God's the one caring for us. He's the one that's been seeing us through the whole time. And don't you get that God is faithful? He's the one that's caring for us. There have been times for all of us that we haven't been faithful. There have been times for each of us that we haven't gone the way we should have gone. But God has always been merciful and gracious and faithful. And ultimately, I think of this text, God's faithfulness, it was seen before they ever came down to Joseph and got the food. God's faithful care for them was seen long before they reunited with their brother. Because God was the one that sent the famine. You say the famine, that's when they were dying in Egypt, that, or dying in Canaan. That's when they didn't have their needs. That's when things were roughest. Yes, God provided them a famine, gave them a storm, so that they'd come to the end of themselves and come to that place with a relationship with Him. The storm was meant to drive them closer to God. The storm was to bring them to God. It was an evidence of the mercies and grace and faithfulness of God. God is faithful to us even when our circumstances seem to say that He isn't. He is faithful all the time. Great is His faithfulness. And sometimes in your life and my life, God will send a famine, He'll send some sort of st storm, maybe a hard time, it, maybe an illness, maybe a, a crisis, maybe some great stress in our life, a storm. But He only sends the storm to help us, to build us up, to strengthen our faith. He is faithful, and we can trust Him. Jacob was terrified of the thought of coming to the end of himself. His heart was bowing low. He had sent his ten sons into Egypt, not knowing whether he'd ever see them again or not. But when he did, he found a God who was merciful, gracious, and faithful. And we come to the end of ourselves and stop, and just stop trying to do it with our own resources, our own strength. We're always going to find the same thing. When we finally admit we don't have enough, we'll find that God always does. His grace is sufficient. He is there to help us if we just call out to Him by faith. And this message, it's not a salvation message, and that's, I'm talking to Christians about our need to come to the end of ourselves. But I can't help but realize this is a beautiful picture of salvation. I believe the text actually, uh, it's, it's a beautiful picture, a type really, of Israel being saved in one day at the end of the tribulation period. But individually, these people show us the need for salvation because there they are in Canaan, in the land of the dying. You know, there's consequences for staying in the land of the dying. It's the land of the perishing. Hell is a real place. Condemnation is real. And Jacob's a picture of those lost in sin. Perhaps he's a picture of someone here this evening. And like Jacob, you're still holding on to your own way, still trusting in your own work, still trying to get by with what you have. But like Jacob, what you have isn't sufficient. It's not going to meet your needs. It's not going to provide for you to the, the bread of life. And like Jacob, there's a famine in your heart that's making you greatly aware of your need. Don't mind the famine. That's just God bringing you to himself, to the end of yourself, so that you'll, be, you'll come to him. Don't be scared of God, thinking that he doesn't love you, that he's not interested in you. 
He is driving you to your knees so that you will come to him. He's always been faithful, always been gracious, always been merciful, and he's waiting for you to trust in him. There was a preacher who was traveling on a train, and he noticed a little, uh, a young man who was sitting beside him who was just so nervous. Couldn't figure out why he was nervous, and so finally, somewhere along the line, he, he talked to the boy and asked him what was going on, and uh, the boy said how some months before he had a big fight with his dad, and he had run away from home, but now he was homesick. Now heartache had overtaken him, and he was returning. And he had written them a letter and said, Mom, if it's all right for me to come home, tie a white rag on the limb of the pear tree in the front yard, and I'll see it as the train goes by. If it's there, I'll get off at the next station. If it isn't, I'll keep going. I don't know where. And as they were approaching the home, the boy said, We're almost there now, and I'm afraid to look. And the preacher said, Don't worry, I'll look for you. And so it wasn't a few moments until the preacher said, Son, there's your home, and there's a white rag on every limb of that pear tree. <laughs> Those white rags, they testified of the loving forgiveness of a father's heart toward a wayward boy. And don't be afraid to come to the end of yourself because God has the same heart of love for you. Come to the end of yourself. Say, I can't do it on my own. Confess your sin and put your trust in Jesus. And he, his precious blood will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he'll welcome you into the family of God. Will you put your trust in him today? Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for Jacob, Lord, and just for all the pictures we see from him and his sons, Lord, of salvation and of how you deal with, with us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we'll learn from it, Lord, that we'll learn that we can trust you, that you're faithful, and that it's best, Lord, just to go your way and to do what you'd have us to do. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.